Welcome to Premise Podcast. This is your host, Angelo Sophocleus. In this episode, I host Alex J. O'Connor, a philosophy and theology student at the University of Oxford and owner of the Cosmic Skeptic YouTube channel. We discuss the current status of free speech in academia and society, and we examine whether hate speech exists, and if yes, how we can deal with it. Using the theories of John Locke and John Stuart Mill, we comment on the notion of safe spaces in university campuses and on how the social justice movement has altered the meaning of freedom of speech and truth. Welcome everyone to this episode of Premise Podcast. Today with me I have Alex O'Connor. Alex is the owner of the Cosmic Skeptic blog and YouTube channel and studies philosophy and theology at the University of Oxford. He is an atheist, a science enthusiast, and advocate for political and educational secularism. And as a lot of people who describe themselves as skeptics today, he has been influenced by the new atheist movement. And he holds the motto of uh, questioning everything, which is also the motto of his blog. Welcome, Alex, to the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. You're very welcome. So, Alex, what have you been doing in the uh, Cosmic Skeptic blog and channel? How did all, that all start? So, the the main topics of discussion on both the channel and the blog, but ma- mainly the channel, which is where I upload most frequently, uh, is, it's like you say, it's a philosophy-based uh, platform, but specifically philosophy of religion is one of the most popular things that I talk about. Um, I like to delve into topics like free will and topics like moral philosophy, um, but the thing that people seem to know me most for and the thing that people seem to uh, come to the channel for the most and have most interest in is the philosophy of religion. So uh, promoting atheistic, secular, humanist philosophy and countering uh, what I see to be religious uh, pseudo-intellectualism. But more recently, I've been taking on uh, the topic of free speech, which, again, I've developed a bit of a, a reputation for as well now. Um, so that's one of my, this might be my second most uh, most important topic in terms of what the channel is focused on right now. Um, I've had uh, a lot of involvement at university as well as, so, so outside of the channel I've been doing a lot for free speech and it's kind of transferred a little bit into the channel and I've had a few opportunities to spread the message of free speech elsewhere. So uh, it's not so much on the channel that I talk about free speech, but in terms of my persona and uh, my, my platforms across the board and where I appear, free speech is one of the top issues too. And that gained some attention after the Steve Bannon events at Oxford. That's right, yeah. Mm-hmm. So we've seen a lot of uh, similar incidents taking place recently. I personally experienced the social justice mob as I had lost three positions because of a retweet that I had made. The position of president-elect at Human Students, the position of assistant editor at my university's philosophy journal and as editor-in-chief at the Bubble, a university magazine at Durham. And I was also deplatformed from an event on free speech at the University of Bristol from the Bristol Students' Union as they cited security concern. Nothing had happened as, as it happens when responsible adults come together and are open to discussing a variety of issues, even controversial ones. But this practice of banning people or deplatforming people is something we see very often in the recent years. We mentioned Steve Bannon. There were also some recent events with Marion Le Pen at Oxford Union. Very recently, Jordan Peterson got his fellowship revoked at the University of Cambridge. We had last year the events at Evergreen State University with Brett Weinstein. And this all seems to reveal a particular problem within academia, with deplatforming people, with banning people, which takes us perhaps into other eras. What is your take on uh, this practice of deplatforming people at universities? I think we have to be careful to distinguish between uh, the, the moral issue of free speech and the legal issue of free speech. When it comes to deplatforming and even platforming in, in, the, in the beginning, Uh, It's a private institution's own prerogative, um, who they wish to platform, who they wish to have, and who they wish to uh, prevent from speaking or attending uh, their events. Um, 
morally speaking, it's a whole other matter. It's, it's a case of whether they should be, able, not whether they should be able to, but whether they should. Um, legally speaking, when you have a when you have a public um, event, a public campus, um, then free speech laws have to be enforced. But if it's a private institution, it can do whatever it likes. It can kick you out for saying the word table if it feels like it wants to. Although morally, um, if we look at it through that lens, we can decide that that's not the best way to be conducting uh, conducting business. Mm -hmm. So. When you have centers for learning that are restricting certain types of speech, I mean, for instance, what happened to you with your deplatforming, uh, the irony of being deplatformed from a free speech event uh, shouldn't escape anybody. It's, it's something which is self-evidently absurd. Um, and, of course, they have every right to do so. But an event like that completely loses its legitimacy if they're not willing to... to if, it's a, if it's an event that supports and promotes free speech then they're shooting themselves in the foot. And if it's, it's some kind of debate, I don't know what the event was, whether it might have been a debate or a panel about free speech, then by the very nature of preventing you from attending because of, of something which I believe was fairly mild that you did and, and something that you said that shouldn't, that even if it offends people, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't make them feel dan in, in danger in need of, of security, like you say, they cited security concerns. At the very least, what they're doing is they're showing that they've already chosen a side. There's no point in hosting a debate if it's a debate on free speech and the organizers are preventing somebody's speech because that just shows that they've already, they've already chosen which side they're on. And I wouldn't particularly be interested in hearing an event hosted by an organization which is palpably biased. So to me, again, it's within any university or any institution's right, as long as they're a private institution, to deplatform whoever they like, but you won't see me at those events. Yeah, exactly. And the event at Bristol was a panel debate, and we were three people at the panel, and each of us had a different stance on free speech. Uh, two of us were at the two extremes on free speech, the other person was somewhere in the middle, and by, as you said, banning one of one of the speakers, you essentially choose a side, a side even before the event takes place, where the event basically loses its meaning. Uh, what's the point of even debating free speech if the organization which hosts the debate uh, chooses a side before the event starts? And it's good that you mentioned the difference between the moral and the legal here. Of course, as legal organizations, they can and, and private institutions, universities can do whatever they want, and that's on the legal side of issues. But even if they can do whatever they want, when we look at the moral side of issues, we see that they have a duty as centers of learning to provide an environment where ideas are challenged, and not only ideas, but students themselves are challenged. And it seems that universities have lost their credibility as centers where, where someone would go and get exposed to different points of view and they would have their views challenged and, and revised and have the opportunity to meet people from all over the political spectrum. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a matter, I mean, I would be, and I, and I am, I'm always patronized to be told by a university campus that I, I shouldn't be able to handle hearing certain uh, opinions or hearing certain things that that I don't like. Um, people are, are very quick to to jump to the accusation of hate speech and say that this justifies the practice of universities uh, from restricting certain speakers and preventing their students from having to uh, be in contact with these ideas. But two points to note are firstly that the students, more often than not, don't have to be in contact with the ideas because nobody's forcing them to go to the event. The event's just being hosted on the campus and nobody's forcing them to attend. Uh, and secondly, the, the the definition that people are giving of hate speech is incredibly is incredibly flawed. I mean, I, I, I understand that I'm sympathetic to, for instance, restrictions not only morally but legally on incitements to violence. Um, but when you're talking about just ideas, I don't think that any any idea is heinous enough that its restriction by law or by moral conscience, um, and I mean popular moral conscience, would have a better effect than not doing so and allowing them to be heard. I think that the danger of restricting someone's speech far exceeds the danger of any person's speech itself, regardless of the content of that speech, as long as it's not a direct incitement to violence, which isn't really speech, it's more of a call to action. 
um, it, it's along the lines of the US Supreme Court's interpretation of the First Amendment. Um, you can say whatever you like, you can't incite whatever you like, and you can't call to action whatever you like, but when it comes to the, to the expression of ideas, like you say, a university, especially a university, has a duty, a moral duty, to ensure that its students can engage with as many ideas as possible and not take any notice of how heinous or how troubling or how at odds with the popular conscience they are, because that should be irrelevant to whether or not they should be allowed to be discussed on a campus. Mm -hmm. And all this ties up to the notion of safe spaces like universities, the notion of not allowing any offensive speech at the universities, even though offensive as hate speech is very vaguely defined. It's a problem that no one can get to define what hate speech is. We've, we've got to be careful. I mean, there, there are two things here. Firstly, when it comes to the idea of safe spaces, there's nothing inherently wrong with the idea of there being safe spaces, that is, where people can go if they don't want to uh, engage with ideas. It's their choice. Like I say, they don't have to go to events in, in the same vein. They should be able to avoid them if they like to. So to have a safe space on a campus where people can go and uh, completely blind themselves to the conversation that's happening outside to their own uh, to, to their own detriment, I think, but they're, they're welcome to do that. The problem is trying to make it such that the entire university campus as a whole is a safe space. That's when we need to be uh, concerned. No problem with having safe spaces on campus, but we can't make the campus a safe space. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I, I try to steer clear of the argument for free speech that is um, about where to draw the line, because it, it's an important point. Like, if you're going to restrict free speech, then you have to decide where you're going to draw the line. But I wouldn't say that because we have to draw a line, that alone is a good argument that we shouldn't restrict free speech. For instance, um, there's no clear line between consensual sex and sexual assault. Like, there, there, there are some blurred boundaries in the middle and people don't know what counts or not. And I could just as easily say, well, where are you going to draw the line between what's consensual and what's not, therefore we shouldn't illegalize rape? Well, of course we should still illegalize rape and we should still illegalize sexual assault, even if the line is difficult to draw. So in the same way, you can say that it's possible to advocate, uh, to, to advocate uh, restricting hate speech, even if the line isn't easy to draw between normal speech and hate speech. What I'm saying is that we don't even need to draw that line because there is no such thing as hate speech as a separate category of thought from normal speech, either legally or morally. Um, I think that if if you if you're going to ban free speech, then you've got the trouble of drawing the line. But I don't even want to get into the discussion of where we're going to draw the line because I don't think it should even get that far because there is no line to draw. The line to draw is between speech and calls to action and incitement to violence, not between different kinds of speech. That's where you get the fuzzy line. But I don't even think there needs to be a line there at all. But you can see that I agree with you. But you can see that there is there are certain forms of speech which they are hateful. The the one who utters some form of speech, they show some form of hate towards that's, other that's groups. True. But, but still, but I don't, I don't think that I don't to, think that speech. Yeah, I don't think that speech exists that. in a in a separate category. I, I don't think that speech exists um, in a separate either legal or moral category when it comes to the actual right of that person to speak. It exists in a different moral uh, in a different moral category in the sense that it's worse and it's more heinous and it's more mindless mm -hmm. if it truly is that hateful. But it doesn't exist separately to the extent that it should be treated differently with regards to that person's right to express themselves. That The right to express yourself can make absolutely no reference to the content of the expression, only to the act of expressing. So, for example, we have members of the Westboro Baptist Church holding placards saying God hates fucks, and that's that's hateful speech, but it's not a reason to censor those people. Yeah, and I mean, it's no more hateful than what's written in the Bible itself, but I'm not going to advocate banning that either, because the only way that people can uh, dismiss these ideas is if they know that they exist. I mean, the the allowing people to say what they want it's, people often say that allowing people to, to have their free speech is the only way that we can combat bad ideas. Well, that's true, but it's not just the only way we can combat bad ideas. It's the only way that we can justify good ideas, too. Um, and that's, that's the important point. It's not just about taking ideas that are hateful and wrong and evil and crushing them. It's about taking the ideas that we hold most dear, that we think are true, and making sure that they're held up to scrutiny and justification. That, that's a point that, that John Stuart Mill makes. He says, I've actually, I've actually got the quote, he says um, that o o on this point of somebody who's, who's allowing their view to be, to be criticized and allowing people to speak against them as much as they like, he says, 
knowing that he has sought for objections and difficulties instead of avoiding them, and has shut out no light which can be thrown upon the subject from any quarter, he has a right to think his judgment better than that of any person or any multitude who has not gone through a similar process. What he means is that if you allow your ideas to be attacked from all angles, that's the most hateful angles, and, and your idea could be the idea of racial equality or the idea of um, the the equity or, or equal treatment of, of people regardless of gender or sex or race or whatever. Um, it, could, it could be an idea that if somebody challenges that, you'd consider it fairly hateful. If somebody says, no, actually, I do think that the white race is superior, like that, that's a pretty hateful thing to say to many people. Um, but what Miller's saying is that if you allow from all quarters, from all angles, your idea, no matter how reverently you hold it, to be attacked and criticized and it withstands those challenges, then you have more of a right to claim that your idea is correct than anybody else who hasn't done the same thing. Because by, by the very nature of the fact that you've allowed what you are saying and allowed what you think to be challenged from all angles and yet it still managed to survive, um, you're justified in saying, I've actually got something here. And you might not have the truth, but you've got the closest thing to truth that we can possibly um, hope to achieve because that is the only way that good ideas can be justified. And Mill is taking a is taking this from a personal viewpoint. He's talking to someone who looks to expose their views out in the world or in uh, other opposing views. And when we see this from an outsider's perspective, as from a university's perspective, or from someone who who opposes your own points of view, then we see this practice of patronization that you mentioned before. It's not that the university has a particular view that it wants to express, nor that it doesn't expose itself to other points of view, but it's sort of controlling what forms of speech are allowed on campus. So it, the university starts as sort of an outsider, as a third person in a debate, and sort of comes to control what can or cannot be said. And this is particularly problematic, the fact that there is a body which tells you, oh, this view is dangerous for you, so you don't need to listen to it. You're not deciding for yourself what you're gonna listen to. And this is particularly Mill's point. If you want to strengthen your own views, then the best thing you can do is expose yourself to any available view on that topic. It's what Mill calls assuming infallibility. Um, the idea that when you restrict someone's speech, you're not just deciding for yourself that that person's speech is unacceptable and immoral. Because like you say, some speech really is hateful. Some speech really is uh, not worth listening to. Some some speech really is quite evil. But you're not just deciding that for yourself. You're not just saying that it's evil. You're saying that you have to think it's evil too. And you've assumed infallibility because you've assumed that you should be the arbiter of what is truly evil and what is good and what is useful and what is true, um, and claiming that somebody else can't make that decision for themselves. Because if somebody else could make that decision for themselves, then there's no problem with allowing them to hear it. So by you saying that they can't hear it, you're assuming or, or, or uh, implying that they cannot make that decision. It has to be you who makes that decision. So Mill says that you are assuming infallibility and you're not doing it justifiably. And also as you deal a lot with religion in your channel and you're very well informed on religion and religious societies. I can see a big similarity between fundamentalist religious societies and social justice at universities but also in society. That there are certain views that they are enforced and if you dare to express any view that, that opposes their rules, you're called blasphemous. People call for you to be fired from your job or removed from positions you hold. And this can be called as the new, the new form of blasphemy. We've spent some time in the late 20th century when we're trying to convince societies, especially in the Western world, that blasphemy is not, is not a crime, that someone can criticize religion and, and ridicule religion. But something else seems to have replaced religion today. It's not something supernatural, it's not something religious per se. But there seem to be some ideas in society which the social justice movement thinks to be unquestionable or that these views should go unchallenged 
but these are also this is also a stance that we see in fundamentalist religious societies. Do you do you see this similarity between fundamentalist religious societies and the new social justice movement? I think so, but it, it's not just religious authoritarianism. It's authoritarianism in general. I mean, one of the reasons why um, people are so critical of religion is because of its inherent authoritarianism. They're not just critical of religious totalitarianism. They're critical of religion for being totalitarian. That's the problem with it in the first place. And so any system that instills anything resembling totalitarian or authoritarian thought will trouble us for the, or should trouble us for the same reason that religion does. Because, like I say, it, it's this built-in infallibility. And whether you grant that infallibility to the church or to the state, um, you've, you've got a problem. And you say it's not a superstitious thing that's replaced religious um, religious intolerance. And because religion is historically where the the totalitarian regimes of the past have come from and what what has been the institution that has been uh restricting speech and restricting ideas and crushing thought it has been religious uh, religion historically but it has been replaced by something fairly superstitious and that's the superstition um of either the power of the state or the power of public opinion it's a stupid is a superstitious notion that somehow the truth just exists in the minds of the, the popular consensus or exists within the walls of the state um, and that can be applied to society and that will create some kind of utopian system um, whereby everybody's living in harmony and there's no hate speech and everybody just loves each other. No, all you'll end up with is totalitarianism and a, a lot of hate that's just repressed and within people that's going to be expressed in other ways than speech. I mean, if you have somebody who hates a certain race or a certain gender or something. I mean, would you rather them express that through their speech or would you rather ex them express that through their actions? I know which I prefer. And I think that any attempt to repress those ideas within people is just going to make them foster and fester. Um, and they're going to have underground, uh, un underground conversations, underground movements that won't see the light of day. People won't even be aware that they're happening. And so they haven't got a chance in hell of trying to stop them or counter them. Um, because the only way that those ideas can be countered it's not just if we hear what they have to say. I mean, even before that, we have to know that they exist. And we can't know that they exist if they're not allowed to be to be spoken. Um, any kind of appeal to the inherent infallibility or the, the sole ownership of truth of either the state or the church or the popular consensus is completely misguided and superstitious. And as you mentioned that banning people does not help in challenging their view or making their view known to the world. And there is great value in making someone's view known to the world even if it's a hateful view we actually want to know if a big proportion or if a significant proportion of the society has dangerous views and we can validly say that some forms of speech are hateful and they can be described as viruses the problem is when they are dealt with as biological viruses i mean how do we how do we uh protect against viruses in in science what do we do we take a small amount of that virus and we inject it into people so that their immune system can build up a tolerance to it and it should be the same thing the ideas that are considered a virus in our society should be allowed to fester in their in in their way within people so that people are able to build up a, a, a reasonable tolerance um, and that involves an ability to not be made to feel unsafe or outrageously offended by the ideas but also a way to combat them um, and and that that allowance of the of the popular conversation to include these uh, these taboo voices um, is should work in the same way as allowing within our immune system a small amount of this virus. It helps us to build build up a tolerance so that when the virus really tries to attack us, we'll be ready for it. Exactly, being exposed to the idea will enable you to challenge it and effectively battle it when it appears or when exactly it just like just like a real virus. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I, I make sort of a distinction between a biological virus and the what can be described as a social virus. So you're right, in, in a biological virus, if you inject someone with the virus, then they're more tolerant, not to that idea itself, but to getting exposed to that idea. The problem with a biological virus is you can effectively battle the virus by isolating the people who have been infected with the virus outside of society. So 
if we imagine a certain group of people within society being infected by a virus, then it's an effective practice to just isolate those individuals so that they cannot infect the rest of society. For example, as had been done with people with leprosy, they were isolated from the rest of society. They even used uh, made up money so that they wouldn't get in contact with the rest of society and that they wouldn't infect the rest of society. In this aspect, just banning someone or isolating a group of people, it helps. However, when we have a social virus, and there are social viruses, such as the belief that men are superior to women or that homosexuals shouldn't have the right to, to marry, then just banning the people who hold those ideas from society, as you said, will allow them to attack society back in an unregulated manner. We want those people to be regulated by society. Even in the case of uh, biological viruses, the only reason that that works, that isolation, is if we, or the only way that that works, is if we know who's actually got the virus. And the whole point with the free speech debate is that one side is pointing at the other saying they have the virus, and one, point is pointing, one side is pointing at the other and saying that they have the virus. One side is the virus, one side is the antidote. And the risk that we run by just isolating people with the virus is what happens if we end up isolating the only people with the antidote and we're actually allowing the virus to spread throughout society. Um, and again, any attempt to actually... There's no way to scientifically analyze someone and see they've got a, a social virus in the same way that we can do so and see if they've got... Uh, a, a physical virus because the the arbiter of physical virality is health and health is an objective standard truth is an objective standard too but it's not one that we that we can so easily approach when someone says something if, if somebody if, if somebody's ill it's very easy to scientifically prove that they're ill when somebody's incorrect it's not so easy to do the same thing when it comes to the notion of ideas so Whereas we can know who has a bodily virus and uh, isolate them, if we try to isolate people because they have social viruses, well, we might get it wrong, and it's not worth running that risk. I'd rather have, it, it, it would be like um, isolating the people who have the antidote. I'd rather allow people who have a virus to continue working in society, um, but in such a way that everybody's vaccinated. And again, the way you vaccinate them is by exposing them to the, to the virus and allowing them to build up an immune system. So in the same way, I'd much rather than isolate people have them in society saying what they have to say but have everyone immune to it or vaccinated against it by having encountered it or having had the chance to encounter it and come up with a way to propose reasonable defenses not only for themselves and their own peace of mind but for anybody who might be listening to their conversations and it seems by focusing on on those groups of people we're focusing too much on on the results on the on what produces hateful speech or or viruses so we, we shouldn't think that the problem, if we have a group of white supremacists, is just the group itself. Because what gave rise to that group, what allowed that group to flourish within society, the reasons this happened lie much deeper in society. They exist in a society which promoted and allowed that to happen. So in order to battle a white supremacist group, it's not only the case that we should look at that group itself, but we should look at the society which created, in a way, that group. So, in the, in, in the family setting or in the educational setting, the, it's there that at the very structure, at the very bottom of society that we need to, to focus on if we are able to, to battle and challenge dangerous views. Uh, Richard Feynman, in a series of lectures that he uh, put into, were um, textualized, and you can you can read. It's called the Meaning of It All. He discusses in the beginning of one of those lectures uh, that he once went to somewhere in East Asia and he met a Buddhist monk who told him that the same keys that open the doors to heaven open the doors to hell. And he was talking about that in the context of scientific knowledge and scientific uh, information and technology being you're able to take the same technology that puts man on the moon and create nuclear war with it. Um, but it's the same thing with the free market of ideas. The same key that allows hateful ideologies to rise and to fester is the same key that allows good ideas to finally come to dominate them. Um, if we try to 
restrict the means by which hateful ideologies rise, well, the, the means by which they rise is through expressing their views and getting people to try to join them. But that's exactly how every single progressive social movement in the past hundred years has been successful. It's been by expressing a view, getting people behind it, giving a powerful speech or two, and changing public opinion. So if you're going to try and restrict people, uh, people's method because they're hateful and say, well, what did these things rise out of? Well, it was their ability to express their opinions, so let's get rid of that. Then you're running the risk of stopping people who are on the right side of history from doing that too. Again, it's the, it's the same key. It's the same key that opens the doors to hell and allows the Ku Klux Klan to, to gain membership. That same key is the key that allows American society to move away from that and see the, see the Klan just, just completely fall apart into what it is today. On this note, we, we have focused on the oppressors. But when we also see the oppressed, we can say a lot on, on the side of the oppressed when we see some differences that lie between the social justice movement and the civil rights movement of the 1960s. It seems that the two groups, which are the oppressed ones or who claim to be the oppressed ones, they have or they had a very different take on how they are going to achieve their aims. I think the difference is that in like social justice movements of the past, for instance, in the 1960s in the USA, they were using free speech to fight against authoritarianism. But today, the left seems to be using authoritarianism to fight against free speech. It's made a complete reverse, and they're making a mockery of what they used to stand for. Mm -hmm. It is a case that the victimhood culture has gotten into the social justice movement, and the problem this creates between the oppressor and the oppressed, or the one who claims to be the oppressed and the alleged oppressor, is that it creates differences between people. It focuses on the bad people and the good people, and the, the narrative of the bad people and the good people is what sustains the social justice movement. It's, it is what's allowing it to survive and maintain itself, whereas the civil rights movement focused more on the similarities between people. It created a circle between a white man, for example, and a black woman and said, these are our similarities, we should have the same rights. But today we, we see the social justice movement creating and being sustained by maintaining the narrative of the oppressor and the oppressed. And I'm skeptical as to how the aims of this group will, will ever be satisfied if there will always be an oppressor and an oppressed. The real aim of this is to make the master and the slave come closer to each other to an extent that there is no longer a master and a slave. I think you're right that either either social characteristics matter or they don't. And previously, you, you'd heard from social justice movements that your race does not matter. I don't care what the color of your skin is. I care about who you are and what your talents are. And, and that was the movement. It, it was, uh, like you say, drawing similarities and saying, look, we're all the same. This, this, this arbitrary metric of race doesn't make a difference. Today, the, the social movement seems to be more in, in the line of saying, well, actually, your race does matter. You should feel special and distinct and unique um, because of the fact that you have a different skin color to me. And again, like you, like you, kind of, like you point out, it, it's taken a 180 there. It used to be about um, trying to take something like race and just eliminate it from the political and social picture. Just, just have it to be a, a non-consideration. But now it has to be at the forefront of everybody's identity, and I think that's a mistake. And that's how identity politics harms academic and philosophical discourse. If someone's most important aspect is not their ideas, but their identity. If someone is shared solely because of their identity, this creates a problem for those people, but also for their ideas. There is there's nothing, in, number... in, there's nothing inherently wrong with with just the notion of identity politics that is to say creating an identity around your political views like a lot of people identify very strongly as, as libertarians or as like i identify very very strongly with my um my, my views on liberty and free speech and and individualism and i feel as those do really define me as a person those, those are 
um, my identity. If somebody wants me to define myself, I'll do it with reference to, to my views on these things and my enlightenment values. The problem is that whatever you use to form your identity when it comes to, to your political um, political endeavors, you can have an identity in politics and you can use that identity to inform your politics, but that identity shouldn't be based on something as arbitrary as race or gender or some other social characteristic. It should be based on, on ideas. It should be based on reason and argument and um, political ends. It shouldn't be based on a social characteristic. That's not how to do identity politics. There's, there's nothing inherently wrong with using an identity that, that, that you that you feel strongly about, you, using a political view or, or an ideology that you identify with to I inform your politics. That's not a problem. The problem is when the identity that you've chosen to do that is something that should have no place in politics, like race. The problem is when identity gets personal and when it seems that you're only saying what you're saying because of some personal aspects that you have, such as your race or your sex. And that's not the case. Ideas should be judged and examined based on their status as ideas, not on their status as who believes those ideas or who supports those ideas. Yeah, I think so. I think that's about right. And just to touch a bit further on, on the notion of victimhood culture and safe spaces, you mentioned before that you support having safe spaces at universities or that you see no problem with having safe spaces at universities. However, the fact that universities support the creation of safe spaces on their campuses seems to promote the whole notion of victimhood, the whole notion of not having your views challenged, the whole notion of not exposing yourself to different points of view. And of course, yeah. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't encourage them, and I don't support their their being encouraged by uh, the university, for instance. Um, and also, I think it's ridiculous to call them safe spaces. I mean, the the idea that because the space is essentially somewhere you can go and not engage with the ideas that are being put forward. Um, that's got nothing to do with safety. It, that's not. That's not. A, you're not unsafe by these ideas. You might be uncomfortable, so call it a comfortable space or whatever. And I've got no problem with that. But like you say, the university shouldn't be encouraging it. It should just be facilitating it um, if it sees fit. And equally, I, I I don't like the idea of them being tied up with safety. Safe space it just seems 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 an absurd thing to say. I mean, essentially, when you have an event, it should be as simple as. If you want to engage with the ideas of the event, go to the event. If you don't, then don't go to the event. I mean, a safe space is just staying away from the event. You're not engaging with anything. You're not, you're not being forced to listen. And so the idea that you need to create a specific safe space within universities is a bit absurd. But if a university wants to do it, it's more than welcome to. Like, it, it, it's no skin off my back. But it shouldn't encourage the uh, exclusion of yourself from events and it shouldn't uh, give in to the narrative that you're somehow making yourself more safe by preventing yourself from listening to certain speakers. So no problem with them making them, no problem with them facilitating them, but don't encourage them and probably don't call them safe spaces. I agree on the definitional aspect that it makes no sense to call them safe spaces. If anything, a university should be an unsafe space in terms of it being challenging to students who are young adults and will soon enter real life. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why you go. Although I, I can understand why, for instance, if you go to a university to study music because you're really interested um, and, and you want to be you want to be a composer or something or, or a musical director or, or an arranger, I can understand why you going to university and let's say you're a you're a black individual who's studying music at a public university and someone comes along and wants to give a speech about the superiority of the white race, I can understand why that music student would say, I don't want anything to do with this. I don't want to hear this. I don't want it to come near me. And I've got no problem with that student being allowed to, to, to avoid having to listen to that person. And the way that that might be done is just by that person not going to the event. However, if the event is just crawling throughout campus and there are protests and people shouting loudly everywhere, then I'd understand why the university would want to create a space that that person can go to and not feel like they have to engage because they have no obligation to engage. However, 
if you are studying something that is directly related to the topics being discussed, then again, I think you have every right to exclude yourself from the conversation, but you probably shouldn't be doing so if you care. And like you say, there's no point in going to university to study that if you're not willing to engage with these ideas. Um, but again, these people should be allowed to exclude themselves from the event. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't like... I don't like the idea that people go to university not expecting to be challenged, but at the same time, I can understand why people wouldn't want to be uh, challenged in ideas that they don't care too much about, they don't even necessarily strongly identify with, but make them feel excruciatingly uncomfortable and actually has nothing to do with their studies. But outside of that, I think that, like you say, the university's job is to provide a uh, a situation in which students can mature their intellectual thinking. And I think it's a great virtue for somebody who is studying music to engage with ideas and discussions about topics that are completely unrelated to music. But they shouldn't have to if they don't want to. It is beneficial, though, to expose oneself to forms of speech which you find hateful or dangerous or any sort of controversial forms of speech because there is no losing sight on allowing free speech to exist or allowing your society to get exposed to different points of view because either you will have your views changed or you'll manage to get someone else's views changed, even if this is to expose yourself to a white supremacist or a flat earther. Well, that's an opportunity to challenge them and ridicule them publicly and change their ideas, hopefully. Or in the topic of flat earth, that's an opportunity for someone to get to know more about science, not from flat earthers themselves, but by researching, for example, why the earth is round, someone gets more informed on, on, the, on the fact that the earth is round. So, yeah, I see no harm in exposing yourself to any kind of ideas. But I also see no harm in allowing people to, to not expose themselves if they don't want to. I mean, they, they harm themselves um, in, in the sense that they're preventing themselves an opportunity for intellectual expansion. But like I say with the example of the music student, sometimes it's just somebody's choice. If, if they don't want to engage with ideas, if they don't want to take part in a discussion, then they really don't have to. Yes, exactly. You don't have to listen to any point of view, although it's beneficial for you. You yeah. have the right not to do so. As universities don't have the right to promote or enforce certain points of view any student has the right not to listen i mean it works both ways exactly yeah and before we close i would like to also touch on some forms of speech which are considered taboo in society or that it's considered illegal for someone to utter those words such as the n-word what's your take on this uh, it should never be illegal to say a certain word um i mean there are moral um there are moral moral connotations with any word one thing I, i i don't think i can get behind is the idea of a word that one uh one group of a certain social characteristic can say and another can't that seems to be completely that seems to completely defeat um it's very strange with with the with with the n-word for instance because context really doesn't seem to matter there like the fact that we're referring to it as the n-word that's just a euphemism for the word itself We both know what we're talking about, and yet neither of us would feel comfortable saying the word, even in this con conversation, even though we're using it in, in, in such a way that we're condemning the word. Um, there's something uncomfortable about merely saying it, and I think that just speaks to the, to the culture of fear that's been created around words like that. And like it should be, there should be a culture of fear around a word like that, because people shouldn't be using it. I don't particularly like when people use it, um, and I certainly object to it when people use it in any kind of derogatory manner. But if there's going to be a group of people who are trying to retain its usage, even if they're using it positively, then it seems strange to suggest that one group should be able to say that and another not. That's what happened to Bill Maher when he used the word when telling a joke to a senator on his show. And the next week or the week after, um, Ice Cube, the rapper, came on and, and gave, him, gave him a lot of stick for it and said that you can't use the word. And this is the same Ice Cube who'd use the, the, the F word, as in the word for, for the derogatory word for gay people, all over his music. And I haven't seen an apology for that. So for him to come on and say that Bill Maher shouldn't even be able to say the word in the context of a joke, but at the same time using another word that's just equally as derogatory, but using it in an actually derogatory manner, I think is, is, it just speaks to the 
the, the hypocrisy surrounding the absolute taboo on that word, not only as a derogatory term, but even just as a, as a statement of syllables, um, especially when compared to other words of a similar derogatory nature that people aren't nearly as scared of. And of course, the intent of someone or the content of the discussion matters. Yes, exactly. Yeah, And, and it's also the case that because words are taken out of context that the end word is bad no matter the intent or no matter the content. We have also seen this harming not only academia or philosophy, but also comedy, as you mentioned. Yeah. And of course, it's a word that has been used in a very negative manner or to excuse very bad or brutal acts. But if we are ever going to change the meaning of the word without, of course, ignoring the past of the word, then perhaps we should be able to use the word because we will not be able to to give the word a more positive meaning if we are not allowed to use it. The fact that we are not allowed to use it retains its negative connotation. Yeah, I think that sounds about right. And it gives more power to the people who do want to use it in a derogatory manner because it's got such a shock value now. If even saying the syllables in a certain order can shock and scare people, then imagine saying that in an actually derogatory manner. It gives so much more power to the people who want to use it um, for evil. And again, I think that's that's misguided. Mm -hmm. So Alex, thank you very much for your participation in the podcast. Not a problem. Thanks for thanks for having me. And uh, it's the least I can do after you facilitated the event uh, last year or the year before at, at Durham that I spoke at. So it's, uh, it's nice to speak to you again. That was a great event. And what's more for you now? I know you, you're also starting a podcast. That's correct. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting up a podcast which will go on the main channel and also be available on iTunes and Spotify and everywhere else. Um, it's still very much in the works, but it should be coming out fairly soon within the next few weeks at least. Uh, unless it's already up by the time this podcast goes out, that's very possible, but it's worth checking out and seeing. Um, but outside of that, I'm focusing on studies and trying to get the YouTube channel back up and running. Perfect. So people can look you up at Cosmic Skeptic on YouTube. That's right. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you very much, Alex. I wish you all the best. Thanks. You have just listened to Premise Podcast. Subscribe to Premise Podcast on YouTube. And make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter and Facebook. The podcast is also available on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Please consider supporting Premise Podcast on Patreon to help bring philosophy to the public. See you next week. Thanks for listening.